My project is on testing modified models of gravity, specifically the tensor vector scalar model of modified gravity. Um, these are considered alternatives to general relativity. This particular theory uh, has come under increased scrutiny recently. So first off, what are modified gravity models? Well, I mentioned that they are considered alternatives to general relativity. Sometimes they're called dark matter emulators. They're a class of models that try to explain astronomical phenomena that we see um, without postulating the existence of dark matter, or more recently, uh, by postul postulating less of it. Um, so modified gravity is a deviation from general relativity, and it involves making amendments to our fundamental physical theories. Um, so in particular, there's a paradigm called the MOND paradigm, and it just stands for Modified Newtonian Dynamics. These are a set of theories um, that try to modify Newtonian dynamics to account for things that we see that are relativistic um, in astronomical phenomena. Um, so there are general constraints for things that are part of the MOND family of theories. Um, Generally speaking, when acceleration really reaches a certain point, um, in this particular case, it's 1.2 times 10 to the negative 8, um, which becomes a new constant, the gravitational effects have a corresponding change. Um, in other words, the gravitational effects are always proportional to the square of centripetal acceleration of a celestial body, and this constitutes a modification of Newton's second law. So Tevis is a species of Mond theory. It is the most extensive attempt to extend MOND to cover relativistic phenomena, and it is considered one of the only complete theories coming out of MOND because it has parts that are testable. Um, it is actually empirically verifiable. MOND itself is just a paradigm. Um, it can have instantiations, but you don't test MOND itself. So tensor vector scalar gravity, or TVIS, as I'm going to refer to it from now on, as a MOND variant, it's going to postulate a certain gravitational effect when acceleration reaches this low point, um, and the gravitational force in the body becomes proportional to the square of its central pedal acceleration. So specifically, the tenets of TVIS produce this result in a non-relativistic weak field, which is when space-time is considered on the local scale with slower speeds. It postulates that there's an Einstein metric, this is consistent with general relativity. A four vector field, a scalar field, this is where baryotic matter is going to propagate, and a non dynamical scalar field. So, already what you can see here is we have two different geodesics postulated one for gravitational waves and one for baryonic matter. So, there was already kind of some controversy about this theory prior to the testing situation that I'm going to be talking about today, which occurred in 2017. Um, on the one hand, we had proponents of MOND theories, and specifically TVIS, um, touting their experimental and empirical successes. Um, they immediately explain what we see with flat rotation curves of celestial bodies. Um, we see them obey conservation laws, and they predict gravitational lensing, which is one of the great successes of general relativity, is the prediction of gravitational lensing. Um, and TVIS itself is... is purported to be able to explain cosmic structure formation, which would be really great, because of the natural perturbations that occur in the vector field once you structure it this way. Um, and then most importantly, TVIS can explain galactic rotation curves, which is another major area that we want explanations. But on the other hand, Mon theory and specifically TVIS have certain problems explaining observational phenomena at the multi-galaxy scale. So once you zoom out and you're looking at much bigger things like galaxy clusters, we start to encounter problems. The most infamous one happens with the bullet cluster. We can calculate the mass distribution of each galaxy in the bullet cluster, and then of course the bullet cluster itself, but only part of that distribution is composed of baryonic matter. We realize that there is a significant gap in the behavior that we observe and the amount of ma matter we can see such that the amount of matter that we could see cannot explain why things are moving the way they are. And this is considered one of the biggest pieces of indirect evidence for dark matter. So presently, the only way to explain it is to add dark matter. This is why it's evidence for dark matter. So even TVIS at this point might require postulating dark matter 
on large enough scales to explain the movement of bodies that we see in galaxy clusters like the bullet cluster, unless they can come up with some alternative amendment um, to deal with this. Nobody has come up <laughs> with a sustainable alternative way of dealing with this, so pretty much we're at the point where Tevis does need to postulate some amount of dark matter. It's still a modified gravity theory because it's postulating less dark matter, but it's not a dark matter free theory anymore. So this is where the experimental result in 2017 comes into play. So in 2017, LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave observatories were in full swing. They had already observed gravitational waves for the first time in 2015, and they were continuing to detect new sources throughout their successive runs. So the particular signal that I'm going to be talking about today is the gravitational wave signal 17817. This has become a very infamous signal because it was also the first instance where we detected an electromagnetic counterpart signal to the gravitational wave signal. So it's also considered the birth of multi-messenger astronomy. This signal was fairly loud. It was detected at LIGO in the U.S., at the Hanford and Livingston interferometer locations, and it was also detected by Virgo in Italy. Um, as mentioned, first we detected a gravitational wave signal. A follow-up campaign was sent out telling other observatories that the optical and UV and, and infrared wavelengths, hey, look for an electromagnetic signal in this sky location. We were able to get a pretty good sky localization because all three interferometers detected this signal. So everybody looked. And lo and behold, they detected an electromagnetic signal. It was initially a gamma ray burst, but it bloomed into a whole bunch of other electromagnetic spectra, which is a story for another time, but it's very interesting. So in the wake of this event, a series of work was conducted that examines the consequences of this detection on modified gravity theories, particularly those that are positing separate metrics for gravitational waves. This is exactly what Tevis does. So a group of physicists, Braun et al., developed a data model that estimated the arrival times for gravitational waves and electromagnetic spectra from the host galaxy of, of GW17817, 4993. They did this by first calculating the approximate amount of matter between the Earth and the host galaxy. If you know how much matter is there, then you know what kinds of effects that the signals are going to encounter on their way here. So under the formulation of Tevis that assumes the existence of some kind of non-baryonic matter in order to explain multi-galaxy phenomena like the bullet cluster, the Shapiro delay for gravitational waves should be significantly less than that of baryonic matter, which is dragged by the effects of the dark matter that we estimate to be along its path. This is because Tevis proposes that gravitational waves propagate along the Einstein GR metric, while electromagnetic spectra are propagating along the physical scalar metric. Thus, according to Tevis, gravitational waves should not experience comparable Shapiro delay to photons. In other words, gravitational waves should arrive fairly quickly. The electromagnetic spectra should arrive long after because it's being dragged along the way. So what actually happened? Well, theoretically, under Tevis, gravitational waves should be detected much sooner than electromagnetic spectra. Given the matter estimates that Braun et al. calculated based on Milky Way data, it should be about a 400-day difference between the initial detection of gravitational waves from NGC 4993, the host galaxy, and the subsequent detection of electromagnetic spectra. In reality, the Fermi Space Telescope detected the gamma ray burst 1.7 seconds after the detection of gravitational waves. So we're talking about a prediction from Tevis of a 400-day delay compared to an, an, an empirical effect of 1.7 seconds of delay. Not surprisingly, this does not bode well for Tevis. This is Baran et al. on the results of their model. They say because general relativity predicts coincident arrival times for photons and gravitational radiation, whereas dark matter emulators like Tevis predict delays of over a year, the simultaneous optical detection from this event immediately and decisively falsifies dark matter emulator models like Tevis. This result was picked up in popular science magazines and news outlets, and the headlines read, 
doom and gloom for modified gravity theories, in particular Tevis. Here's one example from Astrophysics Magazine. Trouble time for alternatives to Einstein's theory of gravity. New observations of extreme astrophysical systems have brutally and pitilessly murdered attempts to replace Einstein's general rel theory of relativity. So, not a positive reception. So it's this idea of falsification that I want to focus in on now. The first thing to do is to take a step back and think about what is being claimed by these authors to have been falsified. Does this result falsify MOND or modified gravity models in general? No, and the authors do not claim that it does. Other MOND variants do not necessarily postulate these different propagation mechanics, these different arrival times and different geodesics, for baryonic and non-baryonic matter. So they're not going to be affected by this result. This result just kind of has nothing to do with them. The thing that's important to keep in mind when we talk about whether or not GW17817 and Baran et al.'s models can be taken to falsify TVIS is the history of the theory. This, this theory has a very particular history in the context of modified gravity alternatives. So Sanders, who was one of the primary proponents of the theory, um, he worked under Bekenstein, who originally created the theory, and he's been kind of championing it ever since. So he has remarked that Tevis is actually more appropriately considered an effective theory rather than a fundamental one. So an example of fundamental theory would be general relativity. He explains this as being due to the fact that Tevis aims to provide only a partial description of the phenomena concerned. This is an interesting classification, and I think it might entail a particular course of action when we talk about the epistemic evaluation of such theories and how they could be subject to negative evidence. So the standard for an effective theory is often not empirical accuracy full stop. It's usually some kind of utility at the relevant scale or in a relevant domain rather than broader veracity and or universal applicability. So given that that's the aim of these kinds of theories, it's appropriate to ask whether an event such as the result of 178.17 can even be applied to modified gravity theories as a kind of crucial test in the same way that it is a crucial test of GR. So in the latter case, for GR, the result is just another straightforwardly persuasive instance of confirmation. GR predicts gravitational waves travel at sea. We measured them. They seem like they travel at sea. Game over. But is it the case that the event 178.17 can be treated as a decisive falsification of Tevis not by the same reasoning? That seems less clear. Alternative theories of gravity have their origins in induction from and adjustment to observational phenomena. So Sanders describes this process in some detail when he reflects on the motivations and methods that first drew Milgram to his develop development of Mond and what he calls the phenomenological roots of the descendants or species theories of Mond. Uh, Mond deals with modifications of gravity by way of changing the acceleration thresholds for the applicability of GR. And that began as a way to explain the earlier mentioned asymptomatically flat rotation curves that these modified gravity theories tout as one of their explanatory strengths. So they try to do this without introducing dark matter. So Sanders describes Milgram's repeated adjustments to the theory in response to referee reports and public criticism, eventually co-developing a modified version of the framework with Bekenstein, which is the kind of precursor to what became Bekenstein's extended theory of Tebus. So what's made clear by this history is that these effective theories, particularly modified gravity, like Tebus, can be and often are adjusted to conform to evidence that was initially disconfirming. They're kind of Teflon theories, in a way. They often weather empirical challenges and are modified accordingly. So such adjustments might be less well-placed for theories purporting to be fundamental, though such adjustments are fairly common in the field. You just probably would feel less comfortable allowing them for fundamental theories because of their kind of structure. For example, 
were it the case that this result showed different speeds for gravitational waves and photons, it would be difficult to reconcile such a result with the predictions of GR. The same speed for gravitational waves and photons is a direct prediction of GR. There's no way to kind of weasel around that. So it seems in order for a body of evidence to be disconfirming for an effective theory, like Tevis, arguably what must be shown to be in need of modification is some kind of core structure of the theory itself, such that this kind of wiggle room or teasing around is not possible to do. No adjustment that you could produce in a successor that was even re like basically reminiscent of the original theory could meet this challenge. That's a much higher standard. So in order for a modification to be impossible for these multimetric alternatives like Tevis, it is arguably, I think, the multimetric structure itself that must be shown to be observationally inaccurate. The fate of Tevis would then turn upon whether it is the multimetric core of the theory that has been falsified and how decisively. There is sufficient evidence in the literature to suggest, to suggest that, that position that the structure itself has been falsified is well entrenched in the community. Many of the researchers claiming the falsification of Tevis are taking pains to assert that their results do not affect all these other modified theories, but only those at which different metrics are postulated. So in order to explain why I think this distinction about causal cores is important, I'm drawing on accounts of model robustness from William Wimsatt and especially from Elizabeth Lloyd. So the central feature of these accounts is that robustness is a property that encourages positive epistemic orientation towards a model or a theory. So Wimsatt characterizes the methodological practice of robustness analysis as a search for invariant features of models and measurements employing varying parameters, assumptions and derivations. Lloyd argues that model robustness is a confirmatory virtue for scientific theories, and it's one that incorporates direct and indirect empirical evidence for the independent assumptions of a collection of models. The members of this collection are related to one another by the possession of a shared causal core, so that is, a kind of causal mechanism, common to all members of a higher level model type, and then instantiated into the lower level models. So in the case of Tebus and other multimetric theories of gravity, the causal core of all the models in this regime is this structure that posits separate fields and therefore separate geodesics for gravitational waves and then electromagnetic spectra. It is precisely this causal core that Baran et al.'s model about GW17817 is purporting to show incompatible with observation. The evidence from the bullet cluster and the matter power spectrum of the CMB, which was another problem for Tevis, those pieces do not directly tar target this causal core. So this is why Tevis was able to adapt and enable continuation of the viability of the theory. It didn't require getting rid of this multimetric structure. It just required admitting that you still need to introduce a little bit of dark matter. So the key move of Tevis is to postulate additional fields within which one locates the null geodesics of gravitational radiation and then separates that from baryonic radiation. What the result from Braun et al.'s model essentially shows is that the gravitational waves and electromagnetic spectra propagate in the same fields, and they have comparable Shapiro delay. So if robustness is a confirmatory virtue of a theory, such that the theory's causal core can be instantiated within models that accord well with the empirical evidence, then Tevis does seem to come up short of robustness in the case of this data model. Its causal core is instantiated in Baran et al.'s data model, and yet that model produces a result with a time difference of 400 days compared to the observed results of 1.7 seconds. So this is the grounds on which Braun et al. and others have argued that Tevis is falsified. So has Tevis been falsified? It has indeed been shown fairly convincingly by Baran et al. and others that the causal core instantiated in models like Tevis, that is, the multimetric structure itself, is empirically problematic. So the content of the theory that would need to be shown false has been 
shown to be empirically problematic. Is that all we need to show that Tevis has been falsified? So some caution should be exercised here when we evaluate whether or not such a situation can constitute a falsification of Tevis. Popperian falsification and its descendants share at least one feature in common. Falsification obtains when there is a logical contradiction between two propositions, for example, P and not P. As Deborah Mayo has pointed out in her discussion of the history of falsificationism, this type of deduct deductive falsification is exceedingly rare in science. Rather, what you see more often is something like physical contradiction, where you get extrinsic constraints that are governing the compatibility or lack thereof of two states of affairs. So when we ask whether the code detection result in Baran et al.'s model falsifies TVIS, what we are really asking is whether the conjunction of the set of assumptions in the TVIS model and the observational result from Braun et al.'s model and the detection result together in a logical contradiction. So does that kind of logical contradiction obtain here? Well, let's consider the following conjunction. Gravitational waves propagate at C. This is an observational result. And gravitational waves propagate along baryonic null geodesics. This is a Tevis assumption. Do these two propositions produce a logical contradiction? No, there is no logical contradiction here. They actually aren't even physically contradictory, as Tevis doesn't actually assume that there are different inherent speeds for gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation. Rather, it predicts different travel times because the EM radiation is going to experience Spiro delay and the gravitational waves will not. They could travel the same speed or not. It's not a, a crucial assumption of Tevis that they do or do not. Perhaps there is a different formulation, though, that captures the logical inconsistency between Tevis assumptions and the observational results. So let's try something else. So let's consider the following setup of propositions that adds in more detail. Gravitational waves and gamma rays travel at the same speed. This is the observational result. And gravitational waves propagate along baryonic null geodesics. This is Tevis again. And gamma rays propagate along baryonic and non-baryonic null geodesics. This is Tevis again. Gamma rays do not experience significant Shapiro delay. This is the observational result again. This set of propositions gets more problematic than the other one. It is physically inconsistent. If you take them together, they're going to produce physically contradicting results, that the arrival times for each would be simultaneous and yet not be simultaneous. But again, there doesn't seem to be a logical inconsistency here. It's only the empirical fact that there were coincident arrival times that suggest both gravitational waves and, and gamma rays are affected by non-baryonic, that is, dark matter, and therefore do not seem to couple to different metrics or propagate in different fields. This makes the second proposition here likely false. But the coexistence of a false premise with a set of true premises is not sufficient for a logical contradiction.
So TBIS is therefore not deductively falsified by this observational result. So what actually is the fate of TVIS if we think that it has not been deductively falsified? So there are a couple different routes that you can go, all of which are plausible. One more accurate picture of the fate that still captures the spirit of the decisiveness with which the empirical evidence has refuted TVIS can be given by Deborah Mayo's account of severe testing. So under this view, what we sometimes uncarefully call falsification is better understood as a corroboration of denial. This is a descendant of the Neyman Pearson account of statistical inference that posits that when we test, we aim to confirm or deny the null hypothesis, not the positive hypothesis. And when a test produces results that refute an assumption in a model, the null hypothesis is what receives a, a certain amount of corroboration, or if you're a Bayesian, it is what we have increased confidence in. Such tests are severe because they target aspects of the model that, in the framework of Lloyd and Wimsatt, bear directly on the causal core. We could also try to understand this in more general terms as a case of disconfirmation or even less epistemically robust, let's say. We could say something like, there's a certain amount of null probability going on here. We just think that the probability now for the likelihood of any of the propositions of Tevis being true, or especially the conjunction of all of them being sound, is null. So what's the conclusion here? Any assessment of the state of TVIS should show that the theory is in dire straits. It is no longer a viable candidate for an explanation of gravity. But there are reasons why we should be careful about proclaiming the decisive falsification of TVIS by one observation, even though the evidential situation is dim. Falsification was itself developed in isolation from much of the methodological features that characterize scientific practice today especially as it concerns fields like gravitational wave astrophysics and multi-messenger astronomy. Popper drew his explicit inspiration from the structure of GR, which is not going to be the same kind of theory as you're going to get with these very data-driven theories, like Tevis and others. In that case, the prediction of light deflected and a crucial test were quite straightforward. All Eddington had to do was go stare at a solar eclipse. But as physicist Sean Carroll has recently argued, this is, se this is seldom the path that contemporary science takes, and this is also coextensive with the comments that Deborah Mayo makes. Experiments themselves are heavily theory-laden, themselves are in need of confirmation for their various assumptions. Moreover, disconfirming, disconfirming results are seldom taken as decisive death blows, but rather theories are afforded the opportunity to adapt. As I have argued, this process becomes more daunting for theories for which the theory's causal core has been threatened. But that does underscore the importance of the scientific community of repeated tests in order to set aside theoretical paradigms. Carroll argues, quote, science proceeds via an ongoing dialogue between theory and experiment, searching for the best possible understanding rather than cleanly lopping off falsified theories one by one, end quote. In this spirit, I have raised concerns about whether or not Tevis has been falsified as the literature suggests. It's unlikely that further developments will exonerate this theory. What then should we take as the moral of this case study? Cosmological investigations of dark matter are requiring an unprecedented level of complex modeling and data analysis. In light of the new frontiers being explored in this area, it's more important than ever to keep one's methodologies in perspective and to exercise care in the scope of the results. Falsification, as I mentioned, was developed apart from much of the methodology.